As a private equity investor, I'm often exposed to one-on-one -on -one sessions with business leaders, politicians, and other high-level decision makers. You often find in these one-on-one -on -one sessions excellent leadership traits that you don't see on the public platforms, but you also find very surprising personality flaws. Personality flaws which you actually realize that if this person is given the time and the opportunity, those flaws can actually destroy them, and you worry for some of these people. But it's not only personality flaws that can trip up a powerful person. It's the type of personality flaws you heard about from Ali when she talked about the police officer who locked her up for no reason. I'm actually getting distracted because I think of my own personality flaws when I was appointed head girl of the school and the hostel at which I was. My goodness, I became a dictator of note. My own friends would scatter when they saw me. I had no money, I had no status, but power absolutely consumed me. It's easy to detect operational and financial flaws in a business, but it's not so easy to detect personality flaws. In the due diligence of a business, the most exciting part is really the one-on-one -on -one interviews with the business owners and the management teams, because that's where you get a sense of the true nature of a business. That's where you get a sense of the business culture, because very quickly you figure out who are the people who are taken seriously in the organization, who are the people who, even if they make good remarks, aren't really taken so seriously. Is it a predatory office environment? Is it, does it have a lax culture? You see this very quickly in these kind of one-on-one -on -one interactions. And what that has taught me is to be a silent observer of powerful people. The more you observe them, the more you pick up that the media persona they market and their true selves, there's a big, big gap in many of them. Some are as wonderful or as terrible as they present themselves in the public domain. But others, others are technically proficient and very, very good at leading other people in public, but not so good at leading themselves in private. That is, that is self-leadership. Others portray themselves as humble leaders in public, but in private, they are actually very self-absorbed. Others project themselves as very self-confident, but in reality, they have very real manifestations of low self-esteem. So when it comes to human beings, we're not always what we portray to be on public platforms. The way I see it, humanity succeeds and survives when we can all thrive as a group without losing our individuality. This is true in a family context, in a company context, in a country context, even at a continental level. The crux here is the ability to appropriate and distribute resources fairly. This is a basic requirement to anybody who has power. It's the crux of what defines a true leader. A true leader understands that in order for the group to survive, everybody needs to thrive. If everybody doesn't thrive, the problem is that the individuals who are not thriving, they don't see the need why they need to be part of this group and why they need to protect this group. And that's when they start acting in an individualistic and destructive manner. The income inequality in Africa is dangerous. The reason it's dangerous is because it's of a structural nature. It often runs along a racial or ethnic fault line that was inherited from a colonial past, so it's entrenched. If the new leaders come into power and they don't sort that out, because often these systems favored minorities, so the group is at risk here because there's too many people in the group who don't feel involved, so they start to threaten the stability of the group. This is where fair leadership is critical because fair leadership needs to take the resources available to the group and distribute them fairly. As an investor, an indicator of a good leader is normally in their management structure, the robustness of their governance structure. Good leaders surround themselves with strong people, with strong structures in any company. If it's weak people, weak structures, it doesn't mean that you're a bad leader. It just means you're a leader who doesn't like to be challenged.
And that is dangerous from a company perspective. But it's also dangerous from a country perspective. Imagine a president with a weak executive who doesn't respect democratic institutions. That's a dangerous president, just like it would be a dangerous CEO of a company. Because we must have checked powers, because we all have Wolfsian and Wolf Macy tendencies in all of us. <laughs> Self leadership is then what we start relying on when people. When leaders have weak people around them, we must rely on their self-leadership. But all of us struggle with self-leadership. And if you don't have self-leadership and you don't have the honesty to acknowledge what your flaws are, that's when you open the door to the corrosive effects of power and money. It's as if a love, or rather an accumulation of money, fuels a love of power, and an accumulation of power, because what's the point of being powerful but you're poor? So later, the, those who accumulate power start figuring out ways to translate that into making money. That's quite simply called corruption. You see this everywhere, not only in leaders. You see it in a traffic officer abusing his uniform in order to make an extra hundred bucks. But you also see it in business leaders who utilize their balance sheets to reward those who they like, to punish those who they don't like. You see their friends, their f families, you see their associates benefiting from the company's balance sheet, from their procurement spend. And as they accumulate wealth, they start liking this new thing called power. Because of their money, they become powerful in their families. They become powerful in their churches, in their sporting bodies. My goodness, even at the children's school boards, they become powerful. Later, they believe so much in their power, they start telling the politicians how to do their jobs. But this isn't harmless. You look at the global financial crisis, that was caused by these kind of leaders. So private sector can bring the world to its needs. You see this in government officials. You see it in politicians. They have the same, they have the same tendencies as their private sector counterparts. The difference is they use the state's purse to benefit friends, families, and associates. They use state power to punish those who offend and irritate them, to reward those who make them happy. Like their private sector counterparts, they also hero worshipped in their homes. They also become centers of power in their churches, in their communities. And they too quickly believe so much in the power and the validity of their views that they tell the private sector how to do their jobs. So when you have these two groups, both believing they are all powerful and know everything, and that the other one doesn't know what they're talking about, you have a very dangerous situation. The point isn't really about public or, 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 or private money. The point is about the corrosive effects of money and power. It's as prevalent in the public sector as it is in the private sector. The reason for that is that the problem is never about the positions. The problem is about the people. Power does something to us. Then we need to look at all leaders in our society. We need to look at leaders in our churches, in our non-governmental organizations, in our media organizations, in our schools. Are these leaders who understand the need to allocate and distribute resources carefully? Are these leaders who understand that they cannot utilize the power that they have to benefit those who they know and like and to punish those who they don't like? While we ponder this, let me quickly off-ramp and take you back to our past. We have a blood-stained, inhumane and painful past. Colonialism, did colonialism end in the year that an African country became independent? Given the structural, the social, the economic, and the psycholo psychological wounds it left, I put it to you that our independence was really political. Because our economic, our psychological, and our social wounds remained to the point where we still remain colonized to an extent. Consider this for a second. Our existing generation of leaders, they were first-hand witnesses to this brutality and unfairness. They were first-hand participants, possibly. 
Did they escape psychologically unscathed on both sides? I put it to you that they didn't. We have a wounded population. We have wounded leaders. I'm not qualified to get into the nature versus nurture debate, but I do think that your environment does play a role in shaping you. I do think it affects your perceptions of what is wrong, of what is right, of what is fair, and what is unfair. Put yourself in a position where you're raised in a system that is structurally unfair, it degrades you, it humiliates you, it hates you, and you become a leader. Will you be a fair leader? Will you be able to allocate resources? And mind you, your former oppressors have an irritating habit of being the most vocal proponents of fair distribution when they never did fair distribution. But you need to be a fair leader because you're a leader of a group. You're not there to represent your wounds. So, how do we do this? There are those who, despite their wounds, are good and fair leaders, but there are those who are not. So how do we protect the group from wounded decision-making? How do we make sure that wounded decision-making doesn't threaten our social and economic livelihoods through unfair decisions and inequitable distributions of resources? Remember how unfairness and not allocating resources makes people feel out of the group, not part of the group. So they start to destroy the group because it doesn't serve their interests. How do we stop wounded leaders from inflicting their pain on the group? We need to be the strong people in the strong structures who act as the conscience. We need to be an Ali who says, I don't want to complain anymore, I want to do something. We need to be a Gwen Lester who says, I want to change, I want to speak up. We need to be tired. We need to be tired of huge egos that need constant reassurance. We need to be tired of lavish lifestyles in one of the most economically unequal countries in the world. We need to be tired of malicious whisper campaigns and real life threats to people who just want to be honest, they just want to be fair, they just want to do their jobs. We need to be tired of those who use the ethnic or race card to cover up their incompetence. We need to be tired of those who have a basic lack of understanding of how important it is for us to share this economy and bring in wider and more participants in the economy. We need to be tired of a government that gets criticized so much and unfairly that it develops such a thick skin that it throws out the constructive criticism together with a criticism that's not constructive. We need to be tired of the lazy, of the corrupt, we need to be tired of those who are more interested in gossip than in informed debate. We need to be tired of decision makers in public and private sector who have such deep prejudices that they cannot and they do not act fairly to those who are different to them. The threats we face as a group are real. They're structural and they need us to unite as a group. They need us to also bond. We all need to feel part of the group because those who don't feel part of the group start to threaten the strength of the group. They actually become a risk to the group. But is it the people who feel alienated who are a risk, or is it the people who are not being fair? There's never a group where everybody is going to be wealthy, but there must be a group where people know that resources are allocated fairly and that there's hope for me or my children to also have the same opportunities available to others. Mind you, there's no point being wealthy and stable in an unstable country. So it's really in all of our interests to make sure that we allow more in the group to, allow, to reap the benefits. How do we save the group from unchecked wounded leaders in the public and the private sector? If someone who represents us in the public or the private sector is talking or acting unfairly to some in the group. This person must be isolated and neutralized because they are actually threatening all of us. We all have wounds. I too have to resist uncharitable thoughts. I too have to resist my worth messy tendencies. I too have selfish thoughts. I too want to use my money the way I want to use my money. I work hard for it. 
but I need to be responsible. I too have to resist the pressure from friends and families, hook me up with a job, hook me up with a contract, hook me up, hook me up, hook me up. I too have to resist those pressures. I too am wounded and given enough power, I could also become the wounded leaders that I'm talking about. Because self-leadership flaws exist in all of us. And people who are honest enough to own up to them are the ones who have the potential to overcome these wounds. The only thing that saves me from my wolf Macy tendencies is that I consciously surround myself with strong people because I know I have a tendency and potential to be a bully. Strong people who can rebuke and correct when I get ahead of myself and I feel my opinions are more important than the opinions of others because, after all, I'm always right. Strong people whose views I value and whose views I respect. And in here is my idea. We must ensure that as a group, we are all strong and that we do hold one another accountable, that we do rebuke one another when we start becoming wayward. We mustn't hero, hero worship our group representatives in the public or the private sector. We must make them the accountable custodians of our stability that they are. Let us stop putting them on the front cover of magazines because they are not celebrities. They are representatives and they must be treated as such. A strong group that doesn't look the other way when we start to see the telltale signs of wounded, selfish, and unfair leadership, because the signs are always there. A group that chooses the best amongst itself and surrounds the chosen ones, these best ones, with other strong people and a strong support system is a strong group. At, because at the end of the day, our leaders reflect who we are. What we also need are strong voices, fair voices, reasonable voices, diverse voices, fearless voices. In addition to voices, we need actions. The problem with power, however, is once a leader comes into the system and becomes wealthy through the private sector, or becomes powerful through the public sector, a whole new person emerges. So the challenge is to protect our leaders from the corrosive impact of power and money. Power and money seems to have the same impact on human beings that water has on a gremlin. All cute and cuddly in the beginning, but my goodness, when that power and money touches, it's a whole different person. Thank you very much. <laughs>